You are watching programming from the East-West Center in Washington, D.C. Good evening from Seoul, uh, Korea. Um, my name is Satu Lene, and I'm the Vice President of the East-West Center. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, Does Asia Really Matter for Americans? Poll results from the American public and elite perspectives. Uh, today I'm joined by a really terrific uh, group of experts, commentators who have been working on a range of issues related to this report. We have with us uh, Rich, Dr. Richard White, uh, who is the Director of Global Attitudes Research at the Pew Research Center, a very famous and well-regarded uh, Center for Opinion Polling and Analysis. Um, we have Ching Feng or Ann She, who is Deputy Editor-in-Chief at the Storm Media in Taipei, Taiwan, and who is herself an alumnus of the East-West Center Media Program's Jefferson Fellows Program. And last but not at all least, we have Dr. James Kim, who is Director of the Asan Policy Institute uh, in Washington, D.C., and is currently here with, um, with uh, uh, Asan Institute in Seoul, Korea. You could refer to detailed bios on the program for further information on our wonderful speakers today. Before turning to each of our participants in turn, according to the program agenda we've sent out, I'd like to make a few co brief background comments and uh, a little uh, context for the report and to highlight a few key findings before we ask our commentators to offer their thoughts on the report. As some of the viewers and listeners who are joining us today are aware, uh, the Asia Matters for America, America Matters for Asia is an initiative that maps the interactions and impacts of Asia across US states and congressional districts in the form of trade, investment, education, travel, tourism, people-to-people -people relations, and other, as other aspects at the national, state, and local level. There will be a link to Asia Matters for America in the chat, and you may refer to it. At the same time, at this, um, um, we also do the same uh, running the other way, meaning uh, the U.S. impacts and interactions across countries in Asia. And there are numerous uh, reports um, and uh, formats that you can take a look at for all of Asia, different countries and different regions such as ASEAN or Southeast Asia. Now, the evidence from that initiative is abundantly clear. Asia matters a lot for America and America matters a lot for Asia by any statistical measure, by percentages, by growth rates, et cetera. And the US government officially has flagged the Indo-Pacific as a, the key region of US interest and attention. In fact, the latest Indo-Pacific strategy was released even before the national security strategy. And importantly, the Indo-Pacific strategy highlights that the region is important for everyday Americans, their quote in the strategy. But we have little or no data on how American elites and publics at the state and local levels think about how and how much Asia matters. And therefore, we, in collaboration with the National Opinion Research Center of the University of Chicago, sought to get some answers on how Americans, uh, whether they be elites, meaning bureaucrats, public officials, business people, and the general publics in US states felt about Asia. What were their perspectives? What were their views about the relative importance of Asia to their local communities and their lives? The, some of the findings are quite astounding and I'm not going to flag all of them. We have a full report, but I just wanna flag three or four before turning to our discussants. First, just 18% of Americans believe the Asian economy matters a lot or a great deal to their states. This compares to 43% of elites who say the same. In other words, uh, roughly only a half of general public compared to elites believe that the Asian economy matters to them. 
in the Western United States, those living in the Western United States are more likely to believe that the Asian economy matters to their state. Only a quarter of Americans find trade with China and other countries in Asia extremely or very beneficial. This is nearly, is only half of the elites who feel the same. In other words, again, there is a large gap between the public view of Asia and China's importance and elites who believe Asia and China are far more important. About half of elites believe trade with Asian countries, as well as trade, including trade with China, specifically, is good source of job creation in their state. But only about 30% of the general public Americans feel the same. So here again, we see a distinct gap, gap between elites and the public, but also the degree of the gap is quite troubling. On politics, good governance, and national security, 49% of Americans believe the state of politics in Asia matters at least a bit to their state, though 67%, nearly 70% of elites say the same. And here again, the Western United States leads the rest of the country in that perspective. A final finding I just would flag, and there are many, many others, and with great detail through the work of the East-West Center and the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago is our flag education. And I'm flagging it because the East-West Center does collaborative research, education, and exchange between the United States and Asia. But while half of elites or 50% say the presence of Asian students at local universities is very or extremely beneficial to the local culture and economy, less than a quarter of the public says the same. And this reflects another degree in which not only economic issues, but education exchange and people to people relations differ between elites and publics at the state and local level. So just to tease out these findings and to set up the stage for the discussion that follows, um, we believe that getting a better understanding and handle on how Americans engage, act, and think about Asia is truly important if we are to have a Indo-Pacific century, one in which the United States plays a vital role in the region and in which Asia plays an important role in the United States. And with that, let me turn to our wonderful colleagues who've joined us this evening to get further perspectives, comments on the report and offer their own thoughts based on the work that they have done both whether that be via media and journalism, uh, public opinion polling and analysis of their own and, um, and their own perspectives in traveling, working and living in Asia. With that, let me open it up first to Dr. Richard White from the Pew Research Center. Richard, welcome and thank you. Great, well, thank you so much for uh, including me as part of this event uh, <clears throat> and, and congratulations on your report. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real accomplishment. You look at a lot of important issues. Uh, and you did a couple of things from a research perspective, which aren't always easy to do, which I think are real contributions. Uh, you know, first of all, comparing the general public to elites, I think is something that's really important. And again, not always easy to do. Um, and, you know, as you highlighted in your, in your remarks, you can often see some interesting differences between the general public and elites uh, on something like how important is the economic relationship with Asia, um, you know, how views about trade, on those kind of issues, I think that's the kind of thing you typically do see, uh, you know, gaps between elites quite often and average citizens. So I think it's important to, you know, do research that points that out and teases out what those differences are. Uh, the other thing I think is really interesting that you do in the report is these regional differences, which you also mentioned, you know, often the Western United States uh, does look a little bit different, you know, has more of a priority in terms of relations, particularly economic relations with Asian nations. So um, that, again, it's not always the easiest thing to do in terms of research. Uh, you know, apology for, for both of those efforts. I think those are real contributions. Um, what I thought I might do is just briefly touch on uh, some of the more geopolitical elements of, uh, of this set of issues and some of the work that we've done, particularly um, internationally 
uh, both in the Indo-Pacific region and around the world at Pew, uh, looking at a, a few topics related to this discussion, uh, how people are thinking currently about the United States uh, internationally, what they think about China, and maybe a little bit on climate change as well, which is one of the topics I know that you highlight a little bit in the report too. Um, you know, so we start off with talking about the attitudes towards the U.S. right now internationally, both in, you know, in Asia and around the world. Um, and this is something we've done a lot of work on at Pew over the past couple of decades. We've seen a lot of changes over time. And certainly we've seen a lot of changes over the last six years or so. You know, when President Trump came into office, we saw a big decline in how people uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, but really all around the world, thought of the United States. Um, you know, ratings went down. Um, President Biden comes into office in 2021. And for the most part, attitudes towards the United States were rebounded and, re you know, re returned in, in a positive direction. Um, so why did that happen? You know, some of it's uh, related to sort of personal leadership characteristics. Uh, people generally um, you know, think of Biden as being a little bit more qualified than Trump. They see him as uh, being less dangerous, uh, less arrogant. So some of it's personal, but a lot of it's about policy as well. Um, if people saw the Trump administration sort of closing off uh, the rest of the world in some ways when it comes to issues like trade, uh, immigration, and others, and they welcomed uh, a more multilateralist approach from the Biden administration, which the people generally want to see from the U.S. And, you know, we've seen in our research over the years is they want to see the U.S working with other nations in a cooperative way to solve big global challenges. So, um, you know, climate's an example, right? Um, you know, President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accords, Biden gets us back in. You know, those kind of efforts have been, I think, welcomed uh, in, in regions around the world. And in terms of attitudes, that's led to more positive attitudes towards the United States. But there are also real concerns that people continue to have about America. And a lot of that has to do with domestic politics, actually, in the United States. We, we ask questions about views of the American political system and things like that. And when it comes to that set of issues right now, people have uh, a lot of concerns. Um, there's a question we asked last year, you know, do you think of the US as a, a good model of democracy for other nations around the world? Do you think it used to be, but isn't any longer? Or do you think that it never was? And in most places, and especially this is true in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, most people say that the US used to be a good model, but it isn't any longer. And in some places you get a quarter or more saying, the US actually never was a good model of democracy. And, and that view is especially common among young people in many countries. So, you know, right now, America's image internationally has rebounded, but people still have concerns. And, and some of those concerns are about the American political system, how American politics is working. Um, so when it comes to China, what we've seen, you know, again, you know, in, in the, the Asia Pacific region, but also in Europe and the United States and other parts of the world, is that concerns about China have been on the rise and, and negative views have been on the rise in many countries. Uh, just to take a couple of examples, uh, if you look at our data from South Korea and Australia, you know, if you go back to even 2016, 2017, you had majorities in those countries with a favorable view of China. In our most recent polling earlier this spring, it was uh, eight in 10 or more in South Korea and Australia with a negative view of China. So, you know, we, we've seen big, big shifts um, in many countries in terms of views about China in recent years. Um, and certainly seen in the United States, you know, attitudes towards China have turned much more negative in recent years. There are partisan differences. Republicans tend to be more negative about China. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the trend has been uh, similar among both Democrats and Republicans and heading in a in a negative direction. Same thing with, with age, uh, you know, young people in the United States and around the world tend to have a more positive view about China, but even among young people, those attitudes have been trending in a negative direction over the last few years. Uh, so what's behind this trend? You know, it's a lot of different things. Uh, certainly uh, over the past few years, COVID has been a part of the story. You know, we did see attitudes towards China become more negative uh, after the pandemic started. Um, but it's, it's economics too. There is, you know, there's a lot of concern in many countries about economic competition with China. Europeans see China 
uh, as you know, a strong economic competitor. In the United States, there's still a lot of concern about um, losing jobs to China. There's a perception that you know, the US is losing a lot of jobs to China. Um, concerns about the trade deficit with China are still strong, especially among Republicans in the United States. And what we've seen from nations in the region is that um, you know, there, there's more wariness about the economic relationship with China on certain fronts as well. You know, take Australia, for example, a few years ago, you know, we asked them, we asked Australians, who's your most important economic partner? Is it, you know, the US or China? It was overwhelmingly China. Now that's shifted in a different direction. And, and people are saying we actually place more of a priority on the economic relationship with the United States rather than, than China. So, you know, these, these geopolitical tensions are having some um, impact on what people think about economic relationships as well. And then certainly, you know, human rights is a part of the story. I know you, know, you have some questions that address human rights issues uh, in your study. And when you're talking about attitude towards China, that's certainly one of the key drivers right now in the United States and in other countries. Uh, we actually did an open-end question in the U.S. Uh, about a year or so ago where we just asked people, what comes to mind when we ask you about China? Uh, human rights is at the top of the list. So that's that kind of issue is framing how people are thinking about China right now. That's one of the things that's sort of driving some of these negative attitudes that we see. And then the last thing I thought I'd, I'd touch on is, is just climate real quickly. I think it comes up in a couple of places in your uh, survey. Um, you know, we just did a poll this spring of 19 countries in different regions of the world. And we asked people, what do you, what do you see as the top threats facing your country? Um, and uh, climate was at the top of the list, and it often has been in recent years. Um, a median of 75% across those 19 countries said they see climate change as a major threat to their country. And it's been on the, the rise in many, many places. Uh, again, you take a place like Australia, um, you know, back in 2013, 52% of Australians said it was a major threat. Uh, now it's seven in 10 Australians who say climate change is a major threat. So, uh, you know, in, in many, many countries around the world, you know, concerns about climate are, are rising. Uh, what we find though is that there's a lot of doubt in terms of people saying, you know, can the international community deal with this issue? Uh, a lot of people don't have confidence the international community is going to be able to do so. So you know, this is an issue, of course, that's often I think, pointed out as a particular you know, area of possible uh, cooperation between the US and China, right? Maybe despite all these tensions, they can work together on climate. Uh, you know, other major powers can work together on climate. Um, you know, right now, a lot of people are skeptical, right? Uh, that, that that's going to happen. And, you know, in some ways that presents an opportunity, uh, you know, if major powers can come together and make some progress on the climate, I think that would help restore people's faith a bit in the international system and on uh, multilateralism to get things done and, and, and the multilateralism's ability to address the kind of problems that people, uh, you know, think are important uh, for themselves and their country. Uh, that remains to be seen, right, if that's going to happen or not. But climate is sort of this you know, area of opportunity if, if, you know, major powers can work together to, to address it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm happy to talk more about, you know, what we found in, in our research. But, you know, again, uh, congratulations on your study. I think there are a lot of interesting issues that you've pointed out in terms of American public opinion. And I think a lot of those issues are important when we look at international public opinion as well. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Those are really terrific remarks. And just what I was seeking um, with having you here is to set this in a wider context of the work that Pew has been doing. Um, it raises immediately to my mind the comparisons between the international findings that you are getting and those of American elites and publics at the state and local levels. And some of the gaps are very interesting. I mean, I just want to riff on one element that you raised was climate change. Uh, we found that there's um, Americans, whether elites or the general public, uh, have a real tough time making a connection between global climate change and Asia's impact on them. So we note that four in 10 elites, 40%, believe that environmental conditions in Asia impact their state a lot or a great deal, with, but only 21% of Americans from the general public believe the same, which is a pretty important finding if climate change is viewed by 70 plus percent, as you say, as globally important, but drawing the connection between Asia and America on climate change is less, and further followed by our finding that half of elites 
favor cooperation with Asian countries and specifically China to combat climate change. Um, but only 40% of pu general public do so and less support cooperating with China. So you get some very much in these global settings that you've talked about, some very interesting finding about how Americans feel about those issues as they apply to Asia. So thank you very much, Richard. Um, delighted now to turn to our good colleague, Anne, uh, at the type in Taipei. Anne, welcome your comments now, please. Okay, thank you. Nice to meet you online. Thanks for having me. It's my great honor to join this great panel. Uh, first, I would like to share my um, PowerPoint. Can you see? Yeah, yes, we, yes okay. we can. And I'm sure our YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, watchers can see it as well. Thank you, Anne. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first, thanks the East the West Center uh, launched this great project, Asia Matters for America and America Matters for Asia. And uh, I, I think uh, it has a very uh, huge insight for us. I would like to, yeah. First, uh, everybody knows Asia is the most dyna dynamic region of the global economy, but I think public Americans don't think uh, Asia matters for their own state. So uh, I guess uh, we have to know why there is a huge gap between um, public and elite. And second, I would like to, uh, say something about the uh, leading semiconductor supply chain in Taiwan. And then I, I want to introduce some of uh, the result of poll on Taiwanese view of democracy values. And finally, uh, I will explain value differences between China and democratic countries. Uh, first, that, um, that's the uh, forecast from IMF in October. You can see that um, from regional point of view, Asia is the most uh, robust uh, region uh, compared to other uh, regions, uh, even under the uh, pressure from war in Ukraine, high inflation, and economic slowdown in China. And uh, it means that uh, Asia uh, offers more opportunities in the future. But from the East and West Center's survey, uh, there, there is a huge gap between Americans and elites on the attitude towards the Asia economy. Why? Uh, I think there are many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, I guess, uh, that's uh, information asymmetry. Uh, more, uh, I think the Asians, uh, get more information from the powerful media in the United States, more than uh, Americans get information from Asian media. Maybe mm. that, that's a kind of uh, difference. And mm. then uh, the gap, uh, different point of view from macro and uh, micro. Uh, we say Asia is quite diverse. There are many countries, the largest, uh, democracy, India, the largest autocracy, China, and uh, also uh, the largest uh, Muslim majority country, Indonesia. So uh, from the macro point of view, maybe elites uh, get more information from Asia and the uh, public Americans, uh, they pay more attention to uh, personal uh, connection. So uh, from my past uh, two decades, I covered many successful businessmen from the United States, and then offer quite successful stories. Uh, they've made a lot of fortune in Asia. So uh, we got more information from the United States. Maybe that's one of the reasons. And then, and then uh, why Asia uh, matters for Americans? Uh, there's a big issue. Uh, both Americans and elites have the same 
concern about losing competitiveness due to the trade uh, with China. Why? Uh, I think there are many reasons, but uh, one of them is unfair competition. I think uh, that due to uh, different systems, different values, uh, for example, uh, digital economy, Americans can buy everything from website of Alibaba, but uh, the Chinese consumers in mainland China, they were blocked to buy uh, products from uh, Amazon, something like that. And then uh, another reason is lack of trust. That also due to the different systems, different values. And then uh, why Taiwan matters for Americans? I think at this moment, uh, there's the tension from uh, Taiwan Strait, more uh, Americans get information about the geopolitics tensions. Uh, TS TSMC is a great and successful company produce semiconductor in Taiwan. And according to Time Magazine, there is a, uh, an article, uh, TSMC has uh, around 55 of the global market for con contract chip fabrication, uh, far above OPEC's 40% market share for oil. So in the digital, uh, in the age of digital economy, uh, chips uh, have more Mm. power or influence than the, the old oil. Yeah, so that's why to protect Taiwan is so important. It matters for Americans, not only, not only for uh, 23 million people in Taiwan, but also for the interest for the whole world. Yeah, according to uh, Mr. Stan Shi, uh, the founder of Acer Group, and the ex-member of the board of TSMC, he said if Taiwan strain was blocked completely, the world would stop. Because uh, you can imagine that from um, smartphone, notebook, and e-car, even weapons, uh, chips, are the base uh, foundation of uh, digital economy. So no one can, in the daily lives, you can you can do everything without chip. Uh, and another uh, that's according to our president uh, Tai Ing-wen, she said the island's chip industry is a silicon shield that allows Taiwan to protect itself and others from aggressive attempts by authoritarian regimes to disrupt global supply chains. Um, this also. Um, offer a concept to that uh, to protect Taiwan is so important. And here, uh, this show you the how important, uh, how large uh, the Taiwan's semiconductor industry. Um, its market, global market share is 63% uh, in the world, yeah. And uh, for the uh, advanced processing chips, that's even higher, 73, yeah. So that's the, the importance of Taiwan. And uh, okay, this, so protect Taiwan, uh, no matter uh, how important uh, the chips, the chips industry, also the importance of value of democracy. And uh, Time Magazine also has another uh, article, why protecting Taiwan really matters to the US. I think not only for the US, also for the whole world. Here, and, and later I will show you, uh, I will be quickly because time is up. Uh, that there is a poll, a recently uh, published by Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation on August 16. How, uh, how do you think the likelihood that uh, China might attack Taiwan? Uh, I think uh, almost 39% say uh, possible or extremely possible. This potential, uh, percentage is increasing compared to the former poll. And this, uh, the fight for Taiwan. This poll was published 
um, by the end of last year. The two fight for Taiwan and China used forces against the Taiwan for unification. 73% uh, say yes. Uh, this percentage also very high. And then uh, this information is a big threat to Taiwan. Nine, almost 90% said uh, it's uh, extremely harmful or somewhat harmful would uh, incur on to Taiwan's democracy. And finally, uh, the value differences between China and democrat democratic countries. Um, it came from a book, a good book, uh, Ultimate Economic Conflict Between China and Democratic Countries. Um, it is written by Professor Cyrus Zhu who is the former uh, representative of Taiwan to WTO. Uh, in, uh, the main thing is um, the basic difference. The value is a value, value uh, for democracy and autocracy. So uh, that's my, that's the book. That's my, uh, my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. You raised a number of really interesting questions. I'll just briefly say that we did not ask specific questions about Taiwan, but as you noted, we did ask questions about human rights, and we did ask questions about cooperation with China, both on economic issues and on climate change issues. So in a way, we kind of addressed that, but your insights into that were very useful. And I'm sitting, as I said, at the outset of our program today here in Korea, as is Dr. Kim. And I can tell you the issue of chips manufacturing, chips industry, the future of chips, production of chips, where they're produced is a huge issue, not only in Taiwan, but of course, in South Korea, which is the second most important manufacturer uh, of chips uh, worldwide. Um, and then finally, I, one thing that really caught my attention was your comment about the asymmetric information, that uh, Asians get a lot more information via American media than uh, uh, Americans get um, from Asian media. And I couldn't agree more if um, some statistics I've seen, I don't have them to hand, suggest that coverage of international affairs in the United States is steadily declining and has been declining for some time. Perhaps Richard has some data or James has some data on this, uh, but I've seen you know, sort of anecdotal evidence that we just have less coverage of international news. So when our government um, and our administration are making important points about the importance of Asia um, and we don't have sufficient information, I think there's a lot of room for insufficient understanding of this importance and why. And, and as, as we say at the East West Center, why does Asia matter? And uh, how does it matter? And to whom? And what does this mean? So uh, thank you so much, Anne, for your terrific insight. We turn now to Dr. James Kim, who is himself a, an expert on polling and uh, public opinion. And uh, James, over to you for some thoughts. Thanks, Atu. Um, I hope I don't get too repetitive here uh, with some of the comments and overlaps uh, with what Richard's already pointed out, uh, as well as uh, some of the observations that Anne's made. And um, as you point out very rightly, uh, Satu, um, uh, as uh, Indo-Pacific uh, is, is getting elevated, and we just saw the National Security Strategy Report and the National Defense Strategy Report come out, along with NPR uh, Missile Defense Review, all pointing out the, the, the importance of this region from US uh, uh, na uh, national interests and national security point of view. Um, I, I think um, you know what you're presenting in terms of the hard data in the Asia Matters for America series, uh, along with uh, this attitudinal data that you're, um, you're presenting now, uh, I think those are really interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a real interesting juxtaposition. On the one hand, you see the reality on the ground of what, what you're supposed to be seeing in the, in the economic data, in, 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 the, um, in the other hard data on immigration, people to people interaction. And then here, these are perceptions, right? And attitudinal um, sort of um, uh, data about where the American public and the elite stand. So I think these go really well hand in hand um, and you should really take it as a package rather than 
you know, cherry picking one or the other. And I think, um, uh, I think that this is a fine job. So congratulations to you uh, and the East West Center for a, a very fine report. Um, so let, let me, um, let me talk about um, uh, this, uh, this piece that you, um, you're, you released. And I think, I think what you present here is significant in at least three regards. And, and, and first, as, as Richard pointed out, and, and this, is, this is unlike most surveys um, that, that we, we come across and we see, is that what you show here is an interesting comparison uh, of the elite and regular public opinion. And I think this is important especially from an academic standpoint, because there's already some very important established literature and political science that shows the existence of this elite public opinion gap. Um, and, and so we expected to see this gap in this report, uh, but without reading this report, uh, reading this report I, I think um, we wouldn't be able to know the, the exact nature and the magnitude of this gap. Uh, for instance, the report provides a very clear picture uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, U.S. elites uh, acknowledging the uh, acknowledging Asia's importance to local state economy. Seventy-one percent of U.S. elites acknowledge uh, Asia's importance to local state economy, but only forty-two percent of the general public uh, thinks the same. That's a near thirty percent gap, which we wouldn't have been able to guess without looking at the data beforehand. So, um, and 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 the data itself also very important in the, in the sense that. We can be fairly confident about these numbers because the sample size for both the elites and the public uh, is quite large. And this is unusual. For the public, okay, I understand that sample size is 1,000 or 1,200, maybe even sometimes going to 2,000, uh, but a sample size of 1,500 for the elites. Um, and I think this is another um, important uh, accomplishment in the data set that I often don't see. We try to do this in Korea uh, for, the uh, for the elites uh, in Korea. Uh, uh, we have a fairly large sample size, but you know, last time I did this, and we did this at the Asan Institute, we only got about 600. Uh, we tried to do a similar thing in, in, in Japan, and we had a really tough time getting a high participation rate. So I'm kind of curious about how you guys were able to achieve, accomplish this. So if you can give us, uh, share with us some of your secrets uh, or the secret sauce in the, in the mix, so to speak, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing how you got so many people to to partake in this uh, in this survey, uh, the second important uh, I think significance of, of this uh, particular uh, report is that because we can see this um, elite public attitudinal gap, we can also see some areas where policymakers in area, uh, Asia could do more uh, when it comes to public outreach and diplomacy. So there's a there's a policy component here, and and this is especially important as we see some uh, important changes underway in the U.S. Uh, as Congress and, and the executive branch begin to make, move earnestly on, 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 on various uh, economic initiatives related to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I think the Asians would wanna know, um, where, do the, where does the American public stand on these issues? Um, finally, I think the data is very useful um, because it's one of few that I know of that focuses specifically and narrowly on the American public opinion about Asia writ large. We sometimes see questions specifically about China, see specific questions about South Korea or Japan, but Asia writ large, I haven't seen one. So this was interesting in that regard. And you're, you're covering a lot of countries in, in some of these questions, um, which I thought uh, made it an interesting comparison. And, and this is important because again, as the Washington's attention turns more and more towards the Indo-Pacific as we talked about before, um, uh, the understanding of the American public and elite attitudes, about Asia is very important for the observers and leaders here in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we're concerned about you know, trending mood and orientation. Where is the US going? And this is one of the biggest questions that, that, um, that um, the folks in this part of the world have because they saw the changes, the big changes that happened after the 2016 election, after the 2020 election. And we're you know, a few days away from from the midterm and, and how is this going to impact our relationship with the US? Will it impact our relationship with the US? Well, you can look at elite opinion and public opinion about these issues to get a feel for something like that, right? So I think it's, it's important in, the, in these three regards. So um, it's a significant contribution. Uh, now, if we were to look more closely 
uh, at, at the actual data. And I'll cherry pick a few things here. Um, that things that jumped out at me, um, obviously, as I said, were the gaps uh, where I did see them, but also where I didn't see them. Uh, so for instance, we saw the gaps on things like general economic significance and trade, uh, where nearly 50% of the elites thought that trade with Asia, including China, were very beneficial, but only 25% of the general public thought the, the same. Uh, that's a gap of about double the size. Then there are issues where we don't see this kind of gap, right? And, and, and the example is on trade specifically on China, right? We see, for instance, um, nearly 40% of the general public, general American public, stating that they're very concerned about uh, the effect that China trade has on US competitiveness, uh, uh, which is very similar for the elites. So there's no difference there. We don't see this gap there. Uh, where we see some differences on the partisan divide on this issue. So among the general public, uh, you see the differences between the Republicans and Democrats. 48% of the average Republican um, uh, expressed extreme or moderate concern about China trade, while only about 33% of Democrats thought the same. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, and this is this difference of about 15% you, you see in the general public, but there's no partisan divide among the elites. So it's 40% across the board. Republicans and Democrat elites, they're all concerned equally. Um, and so there's no partisan divide there um, uh, uh, within, the, within the elites, among the elites. Um, interesting um, that I thought another interesting thing um, was that 66% uh, uh, of the elites uh, think that politics in Asia matter to the US, but only 49% uh, of the public think so. Um, there's uh, hardly any gap among the public and elites about national security, with only about 15% of the respondents uh, for elites and the general public thinking the U.S. should decrease military presence in Asia. So that's same for elites and public. Only you know less than 15 or less thinks that uh, U.S. should decrease military presence in Asia. So either maintain or 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 increrease. Right? Um, there uh, is the rest. Um, there are other interesting issues that stuck out on me. Um, in particular, I thought immigration was very important uh, or interesting. Uh, with about you know 61 percent of the American public stating that they were unsure or did not think immigration from Asia mattered to the U.S. economy, um, only 37 percent of the elites thought the same, meaning that. Um, over 60% of the elites understood that immigration from Asia was important to the US. Um, for me, what this shows is, is that Asian immigrants are not immune from negative backlash among domestic interests or opposed to more open door policy on immigration uh, 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 from Asia. So this is, a, this is an election, election issue, right? And, and I think Asians are not safer uh, than any other categories. I mean, I, we don't know how, how they compare with other parts of the world. So it'll be interesting to see later on if you do do a follow-up to see whether or not this kind of how, how Asians compare to um, immigrants from other parts of the world. But still, it, this, this, isn't, this, isn't, uh, this isn't good news. Um, finally, I want to dwell on a bit about um, Asian attitudes about the United States. I know Richard um, uh, talked a bit about the Global Attitudinal Survey, and he mentioned uh, the Korean case um, uh, mm -hmm. and there. Uh, we've done this uh, uh, sort of cross-country comparison, a six-country comparison um, in Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, uh, Indonesia, uh, and China uh, with some, some of our partners in this part of the world. And it's interesting, you know, you look at how Americans see Asians, and Richard talked a bit about how, how these Asians, how other people, people from other countries see Americans. Uh, in our surveys, when we look at, um, and, and, and Richard noted some differences across administrations, um, and, and it's interesting when we looked at um, Asian uh, opinion about Trump US versus Biden US, clearly they have a strong, preference for Biden U.S. and strong support for it. But relatively speaking, even for Trump U.S., uh, it was more preferable um, to have, uh, have Trump U.S. 
in comparison to let's say, you know, China uh, or or you know some of these other uh, countries relations like you know North Korea. So basically, uh, what I'm saying here is uh, uh, U.S. still very favored uh, among uh, Northeast Asians and 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 many Asians uh, in this part of the world. I, I don't know uh, whether this could be the same can be said about Southeast Asia, but Northeast Asia definitely. Uh, the data shows that uh, the support for the United States is fairly robust, regardless of domestic political changes. Uh, now, how long will that go? Again, something things can change, obviously, as Richard pointed out, uh, Asian public opinion about China has changed over time. So, so that could also change, but for now, things look steady as it goes. So uh, that, that's where things stand, but overall, uh, congratulations on a great report. Uh, I, I look forward to um, um, more interesting conversations uh, over the moon of uh, this seminar. Well, th thank you so much, James. Those are also, uh, as with Richard and and just terrifically useful comments. And you've given us homework. Um, you've given us a little bit of a, a path ahead to to mark our next project, which we certainly hope to use this as a baseline to refine. Um, and make more dynamic in the future. And I really appreciate this. I must tell you that one thing that really caught my attention uh, was your comment about immigration. And uh, this is a big issue uh, because um, it links in very complicated and complex ways to debates about Asia in US policy circles, as all of you on the call know. Um, just follow my logic here for a second and push back at any time. but. The logic is in order to be competitive in an increasingly competitive world and a competitive China, the U US must be competitive on innovation, et cetera, which requires workforce development on our end, as well as immigration with people with the skills to make us competitive. But if what we're seeing on immigration is the case, there may also be some sensitivities about that immigration. Not to mention another issue, which is Asian Americans. As you well know, and Richard pointed this out about negative views of China after COVID, we saw some empirically uh, based evidence of higher hate crimes against Asians in the, in the United States in the context of the post-COVID environment. So both immigration and COVID and Asian Americans, it has implications. Uh, implications that aren't high policy of geo strategy, maybe, but really important. And in fact, one of the drivers for some people arguing, let's uh, tone down the rhetoric on China immediately after COVID because it was inciting anti-Asian American violence. So that's a that's a really interesting element of these relations. Um, and I thought um, your point about uh, the the gaps that where there are no gaps. Uh, is also quite interesting. We were focused on the gaps, but you're quite right. It was noticeable that um, the views of comp competition from China were quite significant, as were the views on, uh, I mean, I'm sure if we refine those questions on security, we'd get some more nuances, but the general support for a US sec security posture in Asia compared to the economic posture. And may I say that seems to me to be reflected in current American support for trade with Asia. Therefore, we have a rather limited, bounded in Indo-Pacific economic framework type approach rather than strong support for a big, big trade initiative, multilateral trade, uh, free trade initiative. And I think that kind of speaks to that gap, that more uh, agita and anxiety about competitiveness and not knowing sufficiently the trade benefits, but um, no gap on uh, concern about competitiveness from China and the need to have a strong security posture. But anyway, those are things that caught my ear uh, as you were speaking, and we can certainly drill down into those. But I would like to go first to Q&A before coming back to your, the panel for further comments. And I have a couple of more questions for each of you, but I wanna come back to the panel for reactions. But first, let's go to the audience. I see one question here. Let me see what, um, uh, 
Dr. White can, uh, William Sage asks, can Dr. White, uh, White provide the definition of elites? And I, maybe you could say something about that, Richard, in, in the context of Pew polling. I mean, I could say something in the context of our poll, but maybe you want to say something more broad. Sure, yeah, and I, I think it, it, it varies, I think, depending on what kind of issue you're talking about, I think, as, as far as how we've approached it, you know, I think there, there, there's not just one elite group in, in the world, right? So often the way we've done it in the past is to, you know, uh, look at political elites in terms of being elected officials, um, but you, there's also business elites, right? There's also civil society leaders. So, you know, we've often approached it by, um, you know, not only having like one elite group, um, but you know, thinking about different kind of elite communities and maybe you combine them all at the end of the day, but you know, you also think about, okay, we have to recognize that there's not one sort of monolithic group of elites out there. There's business, there's civil society, there's elected officials, just to name three. And you know, we could all think of others as well. Thank, thank you, Richard. Anyone else want to offer any comments on elites? James, you've done some work on the po polling and stuff. How have you addressed this issue of elites? Yeah, I mean, I think Richard, um, you know, pretty much said it, uh, but uh, for your report, uh, you, you're very explicit about how you define your elites, right? Yes. You know, officials, bureaucrats and business leaders. Uh, and, and so um, uh, as, from a methodological standpoint, you need to be transparent about the data set that you have. And maybe in the future iteration, if you could show the breakdown mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, of who these elites are, where they come from, uh, and, and how they break down in, in percentages, that, that would also help. But you know, even this, I, I, would, I would eat this up. Um, and I would, I would chew on this for, for many days, um, mm. uh, just because there's just more. Even if I didn't know that, just having this sense and then taking a look at, look at the data, I, I, I get a perspective here that I wouldn't be able to. I mean, what are the chances that I go out there, meet 1,500 people in the, in the upper echelons of American policy and, 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 and business uh, and, uh, uh, and get their perspective and then be able to organize on these questions. Right. I mean, tremendous amount of work. I mean, there needs to be some, some value here that we need to, you know, we, got, we, we have to have certain level of appreciation uh, for, the, for the data set that, that we have here. And, and not only for, from the East-West Center, but also from the work that Pew, Pew Research th does uh, on this as well. So that's why uh, I have deep sense of appreciation for these kinds of work. And, 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 and for the work that both uh, uh, you and, and, and Richard and, uh, and we're all doing in this space. Yeah, and I, I do wanna flag that, as I said at the outset, uh, the National um, uh, Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago uh, was our uh, partner for this and did a lot of the collaborative work uh, through uh, agreement and contract with the East West Center. So I do want to flag that they really, uh, really performed very well. And we we are looking at that data, as you and I have discussed, James, how to make that available and have the raw data, et cetera. Uh, so we we will um, look to your advice and, and Richard's and others' advice. And I, I want to go to you uh, for one question that came up um, in my mind. You know, Taiwan has a new southbound policy. And um, and the southbound policy, essentially, in a sentence, is from increasing and di diversifying Taiwan's links with Southeast and South Asia, uh, and partly to reduce the dependence on China, which is still very high uh, for Taiwan. I think the last time I looked, a million Taiwanese citizens work in China. Uh, much of Taiwanese manufacturing is located in China. Um, if you were to do a survey in Taiwan about Southeast Asian countries, South Asian countries, I wonder what it would show. Do you have any, I, I'm asking you a speculative question, obviously, but, you know, um, my understanding is there is, um, there is still quite limited understanding in Taiwan about the rest of Asia because of the focus on China. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, oh, it's a, 
it's not easy to answer. Mm. Uh, I think uh, in a, the, there are some good news at this moment because uh, from government's uh, statistic, the trade volumes uh, is increasing. Now ASEAN countries uh, will be the biggest part of our partner. Uh, mm. I think uh, larger than China. Yeah, mm. the increasing. Yeah, uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, and uh, also more and more uh, Chinese businessmen and companies to invest in is uh, in Southeast Asia. For example, uh, many businessmen they move their factories to uh, Vienna. Vienna. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. due to the tensions uh, between Taiwan Straits. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you are right. Uh, we need to do more to uh, have more communication and um, to know more about uh, Southeast Asia. And I think India uh, will be a huge market for mm. Taiwanese company and uh, many electronic companies mm. looking forward to India. Yeah. I see. And so uh, I know there are many Indians uh, come to Taipei to learn uh, Chinese. I see. Yeah, yeah, they have special programs. Yeah, and uh, there are many uh, Chinese in Southeast Asia, and there are many um, people from Southeast Asia to Taiwan mm. uh, service sector. Yeah, and uh, they study uh, in tai Taiwan and the students, so they are more. And also we have many, um, the young generation, the wives, I mean the marriages between Taiwan and uh, Taiwanese people and the uh, South Asia uh, huh. women, yeah. Huh. So many uh, newborn babies came from their mothers, came from South Asia. So they, are, there will be more links. I see. Yeah. Interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's great. I, I I was asking this question because I've been doing some work on Taiwan and Asia in the context of the New Southbound policy, but it seems to me that Taiwanese attitudes about the rest of Asia are still developing, and knowledge is still uh, less than than one might expect. Um, Richard, I wanted to turn to you a little bit about these uh, broader trends that you highlighted. Um, the shifts on competition, um, sort of a, a more negative thing, and, and link it to something James asked about Northeast Asian views versus Southeast Asian views. The Institute of Southeast Asian Studies does an annual survey of Southeast Asian views of their dialogue partners. And it varies by year to be sure. And you can look this up online. It's Institute of Southeast Asian Studies annual survey. But, you know, there are some really uh, striking findings in that survey, too. And we'd asked Sharon, who runs that, Sharon C. from ICES to join us. She wasn't able to join us today, unfortunately, for scheduling reasons. But that study is also very interesting that shows that China and the U.S. are almost at the same general level of very low trust in Southeast Asia. Um, and China is actually higher on COVID provision, despite the huge amount of American provision of vaccinations, et cetera. So there were, those were two findings that were quite important. And, and get this, the highest trusted dialogue partner of ASEAN in the IC survey is Japan at over 70%. I don't know a current leader in the world that has an elected leader that has 70% approval ratings, but Japan does in Southeast Asia, which is really quite striking um, when compared to the low levels of China. I wanted to ask you, therefore, uh, uh, Richard, what are we to make of these, um, yes, negative views of China have increased, but there's some very positive views of the European Union, Japan, um, even Korea gets relatively good views, not seen as a huge player, but relatively good views. 
how should we think about not just the rising anti-China views across Australia, uh, EU, uh, US, et cetera, but how should we think about other players in this increasingly multipolar international environment? Yeah, I think it's a good it's a good question, right? We you know it's not just the U.S. and China; it's it's uh, you know other big players, right? The EU, as you mentioned, Japan, and you know other other you know, India. I think a, 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 you know came up in the conversation a little bit. I think uh, mm -hmm. it's an interesting country to look at international perceptions of, and something we want to do a little bit more of mm. next year as India is going to be hosting the G20. So right. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, there are a lot of players in the international system we need to be thinking about. Um, you know, I, and I want to look into this study a bit more. You mentioned it really, it sounds really interesting from, from Southeast Asia. We've been a little limited over the past couple of years in, in doing work in Southeast Asia and some other countries because of the pandemic. We tend to do face to face interviews in a lot of countries. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, it's been difficult to do during the pandemic. So one of the things we're excited about next year is getting back into the field in, you know, Indonesia, for example, where we haven't, actually surveyed since before the pandemic um mm -hmm. you know one thing i would say is 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 that um um you know thinking about covid we, we talked a little bit about how it it, it um uh, you know impacted people's views about china you mentioned how it impacted views about um uh, the U.S. maybe a little bit too. You know, what we mm -hmm. saw in 2020 was really a big plunge in ratings for China, but also a big plunge for ratings for the United States. Um, and that was, you know, that was after we'd already seen a downturn when Trump came into office, right? So the way the U.S. handled the pandemic in 2020 really kind of hurt America's image you know, uh -huh. even more than it had been over the, the previous three or so years. So, yeah, I think it's an issue that's has affected how people sort of see America's ability to deal with the crisis, right? I think it kind of feeds into these concerns people have um, in many places about the sort of functioning of the American political system I mentioned earlier, the functioning of American government and that set of issues. So, you know, COVID, um, it raised issues about how people see the United States and, and you know, that, that linger on, I think, even if people are much happier with America now than they were under Trump. Some of these concerns that came up in the Trump era are still there in many instances. That's, that's very, very useful. And by the way, as you were speaking and speaking about Indonesia and the polling on Southeast Asia, we have a question which asks exactly that. If forced to choose between US and China, this is an anonymous attendee. If forced to choose between US and China, what does the panel think ASEAN will choose? Any polling done on this issue? And to the anonymous attendee, I would say that I've just asked our team to put in the chat the link on the IC survey, uh, annual survey, because that addresses directly this question. And if I might say, summarize in a very brief and slightly uh, a colloquial way. It's a little bit of pox on both your houses. Um, you know, the U.S. is considered very important partner. China is considered, but there is a real sense that we don't want to be caught up in these battles. We don't want to choose. We don't want to make these choices. Uh, we have lots of other options. We will navigate this, um, but do look at the survey in more detail. And I have asked uh, Kimmery and Toya to please uh, kindly post that link in but any other thoughts on that, uh, since that is a question that was posed? I mean, Korea, does this come up a lot, uh, James, in Korea? I know you work both in the US and in Korea, so. Uh, so yeah, when we did, the, we, we did the cross-country comparison, we saw that in Indonesia, at least, uh, mm. it was, as you pointed out, uh, it was more even evenly distributed, but uh, this was not a, this was not a question for the Australians, the Koreans, and and, and the Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, mm -hmm. there was a different 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 point of view, obviously about about the, the, the relative preference of the U.S. and China. If if the if the, if the question was a, a forced question, mm -hmm. and you, you have to choose between the two, and there's no other third option. Um, right. And 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 post COVID, I think. Uh, it's interesting that Richard points out that uh, uh, some countries uh, were were not were not happy or not thrilled with how the U.S. handled uh, uh, the, the COVID situation. 
Um, uh, but uh, all in all, uh, as I've said, in, in Northeast Asia, uh, maybe perhaps because of the realities, the geopolitical realities, you have in Japan and South Korea, treaty allies with the United States. Um, uh, perhaps because of, uh, of this linkage that goes back many, many years. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's, just, it's just a non, it's really a non-issue if you had to choose between the US and China, uh, 80 to 90% uh, support uh, and choose the United States and both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet the Korean government is quite careful in the way in which it uh, responds to things like the Quad and some certain initiatives, right? The way it's framed and the way it's articulated in Korea is still sensitive to... to... Well, you know, you take a look at the last joint statement, uh, uh, the last two joint statements under two different administrations in Seoul uh, uh, in 2021 under President Moon Jae-in, 2022 under uh, uh, President Yoon song yeol uh, both in May 2021, 2022, mm. uh, minor differences, right? They both support, uh, in the first case, uh, looking for um, complementarity in the President Moon's new Southern policy and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. Right. Where you, the big shift in 2022 is uh, just wholehearted support for mm. the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm -hmm. and, um, UN administration committing to drafting up its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm -hmm. Where we see some um, interesting um, sort of, you know, uh, how should I say, contradiction or paradox perhaps, is um, UN administration's approach to China. So UN even though the, uh, the new administration in Seoul wants closer relations with United States, uh, its policy uh, position with respect to China is one of mutual mutual respect. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, uh, uh, although Seoul wants to be closer to Washington, it also wants to maintain close relations with Beijing. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of an inherent contradiction there, right? As you're getting closer to Washington mm -hmm. and on Indo-Pacific, you're in fact, becoming more and more sort of, you know, sure. China's adversary. And, sure. and so how, do you, how do you square that? I don't know. I, I really don't know how you work that out. But these policies, it seems as though the current administration in Seoul is treating it as silo, as different kinds of policies. And they're, they're, at least they're, they're trying. Um, I, I happen to think that it's going, to, there are limitations to, to this. Oh, absolutely. It's going to get harder and harder as... Uh, particular forms of technology cooperation, coalitional elements in strategy begin to develop. Right, but in Japan, you, you see, I think uh, Kishida administration has has made uh, a strategic uh, choice mm. in the United States, uh, but there are still certain issues, right? And companies in Japan are really hard pressed to figure out how to, how to navigate this environment mm. because have a big um, stake uh, in the economic relationship with, with China, uh, yet, um, you know, the government is uh, supporting uh, the U.S. approach on a lot of these economic initiatives we just talked about, I, you know, Inflation Reduc uh, uh, Reduction Act, uh, along with uh, some of these regulations on export controls uh, and investment. IPEF. IPEF. Right, um, and, and, and IPEF, uh, right? But uh, on CFIUS as well. Um, mm -hmm. So Japan is, is, is sort of pushing um, and, and, and moving along, albeit begrudgingly in some certain quarters, uh, but, uh, but Korea uh, still hasn't completely made that shift yet, or they're in the process of doing it. We just haven't seen a, a you know, a complete all in on, on the U S mm -hmm. just. Right. Well, thank you. I am conscious of the time and I'm conscious that in Washington, at least um, the day is just beginning in Taiwan. I know it's late in the evening for us here in Korea and Taipei. Um, so let me ask uh, if any of the panelists have any questions for each other as a result of your comments. 
before we turn to sort of close the session because I, there are no additional questions. And as you know, there is a, a concurrent live stream on YouTube, but those uh, that is not a format that permits us to take questions and answer them on a Zoom call. So there may well be questions amongst our viewers, but we're not uh, kind of privy to them. Hopefully they'll send them to us. Uh, any thoughts, Anne? Um, Richard? Yeah, please, Anne, please. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about uh, both the uh, Americans and elites are concerned about losing competitiveness due to trade with China. But mm -hmm. uh, while mm, competitiveness is um, a concern, but uh, a majority of elites support both new bilateral and the multilateral trade agreement with Asian countries. How, how do you explain it? Yeah, I, I can't explain all of it because um, elites, and as I said, probably for reasons related to eff efficacy of doing business, transaction costs, may support certain measures that facilitate trade, right? But they doesn't mean that competitiveness towards China is dealing. They're not separate, mutually exclusive things. You could still be very concerned about competitiveness to China because of state subsidies, because of um, uh, misuse of WTO, um, intellectual property theft, whatever the case you think may be happening in your particular commercial sector, but still support. And they're also second, not only are they not mutually exclusive, but they're not necessarily contradictory. Because as you know, there was thinking. Now, it seems such an, an era so long ago. When American support for TPP, there were people who argued that there were not, yes, there were to be sure some marginal benefits of economic benefits of joining TPP. But the real benefits were setting the rules for Asia and for the most dynamic economic region in the world. And therefore, it would induce or pressure, however you want to frame it, or motivate China to dock on at the highest standards of rules, which would take away the, the unfair competitiveness. It wasn't the competitiveness per se, but the perception of unfair competitiveness that's driving this. So that's how I would explain it, but I, I I welcome comments from Richard and James if they have any on this issue. But that's how I would answer such a question. Richard, James, any thoughts? I mean, Richard can add. I mean, any choice, any policy choice, Satu, you you know this, uh, and I think uh, Anne knows this as well. Any policy choice you make or any choice you make, there are risks associated with those choices. Yeah. So there's a downside risk, but you still look at the, you know, on net, uh, what, the, what the benefits are. Um, and, and so uh, maybe the preference for multilateral trade uh, is something uh, that they would support, uh, even if there are these risks associated with competitiveness and trade with China. So that's, uh, that's one way to put it, right? Thank you. Uh, Richard, any thoughts on this? And then also I, uh, I have a specific question for Richard, given the work of Pew. No, I think that's right. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, what's often tough uh, as a researcher right, is to build in those risks to your question, right? How do you, how do you, you know, a complex policy issue, how do you kind of lay all that out? But, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that's exactly right. How, you know, it's those various sort of components of an issue that can affect how people think about it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Richard, uh, while you're on, let me ask you that our att att anonymous attendee who asked the earlier question about Southeast Asian views um, notes in, in the response, quite rightly, that the link we put in is an IC survey of elite opinion. And he wonders, he or she wonders if there's a survey of the Southeast Asian masses opinion towards US and China. The Pew Global Attitude Survey only includes Singapore and Malaysia. Do you have any information? Are there any some... Uh, more general public views uh, that you know about? And do you plan to expand your work uh, at Pew, Richard, on, in this space? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, uh, the, 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 the viewers uh, interested, uh, if you go back to say 2019, we had a broader range of kind of countries from the Indo-Pacific area then, and we often have in the past. Uh, and I think we will move forward just to, you know, again, to kind of focus on, on our, our work uh, internationally. Um, as I said, we've been a bit limited over the past few years because of the pandemic and haven't been able to survey for a variety of reasons as many countries as we'd like. So, you know, as you note, uh, as, as a viewer notes, um, Malaysia and Singapore has been a bit more of a focus, say, over the past year in our work. But we're going to expand that to, to Indonesia and, and India. Uh, we're going to be in Latin America and Africa uh, you know, to a great extent they've been over the past few years. So, you know, the, the short answer is, is yes, we're going to look more at Southeast Asia moving forward and other um, other regions of the world where we've been a little bit limited over the past couple of years due to the pandemic. So that's something we're really excited about at Pew is getting into uh, other parts of the world where we haven't been over the past couple of years to look at some of these big issues. Oh, that's terrific. I'm looking forward to that, Richard. I'll keep a Keep a close eye out for that. Uh, any other comments, questions to each other before we wrap up for the evening slash morning and move on with our uh, night and with our day for Richard? Any other thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Um, I, which was the po question you posed out to, um, to both Anne and, and Richard, and maybe perhaps even to you, Satu. Um, how would you, in the future iteration, how would you change uh, the survey? So what are some previews of things to come? Um, what are some recommendations you would make to make the report even uh, more uh, more worthwhile um, for people like me who was going to be on the lookout for these for these data sets? Um, and and second, second is uh, on the on the methodological and building some of these um, cost related issues as Richard pointed out. Could you have, um, can you think of like some question word designing, like for instance, let's say, would you support multilateral trade? First question. And then you look at the percentage breakdown. Would you still support multilateral trade if it results in decreased competitiveness as a result of it being trade with China? Um, and see if there's a change in that percentage after you ask these questions. So there are ways to do this, but yeah, you're right. It's it's tricky, uh, Richard. Yeah. But can you think of, can you think of a good, uh, good um, sort of rule that we can use when, as I'm thinking about these kinds of things, when I'm designing questions uh, uh, on, on how to move, or, or is there, is it just kind of, you just got to try different things and, and see what works? Well, I can't wait to hear what you, Anne, and Richard are going to advise us for a next iteration. We will certainly plan to do a next iteration. My hunch is what I'd like to do, and I'll put it right out there. I'd love to do this poll before the 24 general election in the United States. Um, because to get a, a state of play on Asia in which two Indo-Pacific strategies have come forth and where we are at the time. But I'll tell you two concerns, and I, I, I will tell you where I really would love to go with the poll. Not so much multilateralism, because that gets pretty wonky fast. Multilateral what, IPEF, I mean, you know, these it becomes really, I guess what I'd want to know are maybe more targeted questions drawn from the Indo-Pacific strategy about how Americans feel this strategy is or isn't valuable to their interests, to the empirical evidence for Asia matters. You know, I'd even like to, I think, frame it as follows. I mean, I, I'm being very crude here in the sense of uh, unrefined ways of questioning, and Richard will probably have a, quite a reaction, a visceral reaction to this lack of scientific rigor here. But just thinking out loud late at night here in Korea, I'd want to ask, your state relies for X percentage of its employment from FDI from Asia. Would you, what tools would you advocate that would further increase that foreign direct investment into your state to provide more jobs? Is it worth it? Or things like that, that are take our baseline and then move it to policy, policy ideas that are either floating around at that time 
and or are signaled in the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report. Uh, the U.S. should build more um, bespoke arrangements with allies and partners to address competitiveness concerns from China, yay or nay. Do, do you follow the logic of the next set of questions? And then release that before the 2024 general elections. So we could use kind of a this as a, a as a baseline of the gaps in thinking. And now the next one would be sort of, okay, what do you want to do about it? So that would be my simple first uh, visceral answer to your query. But let me turn to uh, Anne first and then Richard. Anne, any thoughts on this matter that James raises? I, I think this question, if you ask elites, maybe it's more easy for them to answer. But if you ask public, uh, everyday Americans, it's difficult for them. Mm. That's what I was kind of hinting at about the, you know, it gets pretty wonky to talk about IPEF. I mean, I, mean, I, I again, we're on a public open seminar, and I don't want to, you know, you know, be too um, too glib. But you know, I, I, I mean, I think if you said IPEF around the country, there would be a lot of officials, even elite level, who may or not be made in, involved in national policy making, or like, what are you talking about? Is this a new sports league? What, what, what is it that you're speaking of? This IPEF thing, right? I mean, that's not a common term that's thrown around. Um, that's something you might ask members of Congress or elites at the Washington, D.C., New York, Boston policy nexus. But I'm not sure I would I, I don't expect the average person to know that detail about, you know, these uh, acronym based policy uh, initiatives. So that'd be my thought. Richard, uh, please, please. Uh, I think that's right, Seth. I think, you know, you've got to be really careful when you're talking to average citizens to you know, not throw too many acronyms at them and not assume that they spend a lot of time sort of thinking about the, the details of foreign policy or right. international economics, all those kind of things. But, but I do think, you know, you can often get at it uh, by asking about their general attitudes. And mm -hmm. you know, I think your instinct is, is right, too, that, you know, you, you've sort of identified with this research some interesting gaps you've you know you see that okay you know there's a gap between what average citizens think about the importance of, of the connections with asia economically maybe what elites think so maybe you know drill down on that a little bit more mm -hmm. right see are there scenarios in which people actually kind of you know do see more connections or what might they want to do about it how much might they value it uh so i think that you know you, you, you've got this, you know, this round of research, some results that are really interesting and you know, thinking about, okay, what are the questions next time? Where can we drill deeper to get to, to unpack that a little bit more uh, is, is exactly the right one. Thank you. And any suggestions from you, James? Uh, yeah, I mean, just like what Richard said, uh, and I think I, I would echo what Ann said, but uh, adding new things, uh, if you uh, want to sort of work around the edges to get deeper on one of these issues, uh, you know, provided that you're careful about it, that's okay. But um, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I would keep some of these questions because, the, you know, uh, over time, the comparisons. Uh, Absolutely. On changes on some of these issues, if they do change, uh, you, you would keep some of these so that we could see yes. the, those trends. Absolutely. And one of this, you know, we really did try to establish a baseline we could work from. So we don't want to lose all these questions. Because quite frankly, I've said this about the Asia Matters for America initiative. You know, someone said to me during the Asia Matters process over the last decade of producing these reports, well, none of this information, none of this data is, um, you've not created new primary data meaning you've not built a new primary statistical base. And I said, that's true. We haven't collected um, receipt chits from customs uh, ports, et cetera, to create a new data set. But never has all of the data set about our interactions with Asia been integrated into one repository where you could access them and manipulate, meaning use them, to apply to congressional districts and states. There is education data. There is sister city partnership data. There is uh, travel and tourism data. 
but it's the integration of them that adds value, right? And for the poll, my view is having a baseline about American attitudes toward certain things would have to be replicated in order to provide comparative frameworks. But you could tweak elements of the poll in the future along the lines we've all been talking about, policy prescriptions, to tease out some more of those details about gaps, um, et cetera. And speaking of which, I, you know, I'm conscious now we have four minutes left of our time. We have Adriana Renike, I hope I pronounced this correctly, asks, what recommendations would you make to policy practitioners for addressing this awareness gap between the elites and the general public? So maybe let's close with that question by going round robin, uh, beginning with our um, uh, first speaker, uh, Richard, then Anne, and then closing with James. Yeah, well, you know, it's a good question. I, I mean, it's a difficult challenge in some ways, right? You know, it, it's uh, there's a lot of issues that are, are uh, competing for the attention of, of the general public, right? So it's always hard to figure out how you're going to get those issue priorities to change. But, um, you know, I think the, it's always important to, to tie it to issues that, that people care about. You know, if people care about the economy, for example, right? So, you know, when you can certainly get their attention by talking about economic issues. Um, and I think, you know, the challenge is to try to make people understand how uh, you know, what's happening in Asia might apply to their lives. Same thing in climate. We talked about a little bit earlier. So you point out you're finding people aren't necessarily seeing the connection between what's happening uh, in Asia and, and issues on climate. But we know climate is something people do care about, right? So that, I think, you know, there's the challenge. I don't have all the answers on how to do that, but always keeping in mind, what is it people care about taking your issue and tying it to that um, is, is really important. And over to you. Okay, uh, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think from the result of the survey, uh, we need to have more engagement between the US and Asia because Asia is quite diverse. May, actually, many countries, many languages, many culture. And um, so uh, we need uh, more people-to-people uh, -people connection engagement. Um, to improve mutual understanding, maybe we can find the common values, even though there are a lot of different uh, value differences, but we need to find common values to need more engagement. It's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And, and uh, you as a East West Center alumnus, having engaged uh, in this exchange of media personnel is really a great testament to that. So thank you so much. A great honor. James, over to you for the final word on this, and then I'll close this out. Well, I mentioned it. Um, I think policymakers in Asia, uh, when they look at this data and think about how to communicate uh, to the American public, uh, if they are communicating to the American public, uh, they have to look at where they're starting from. This is their starting point. Uh, and for policymakers in Washington, Every political cycle, I think Richard knows this and Anne knows this, you do, you do as well. They, you, they, they look at this data uh, mm -hmm. and to figure out how they need to talk to the constituents. So um, I, I think that um, it's built into the democratic um, sort of arrangement, the institution that we have uh, in our society. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's useful uh, uh, in, in different ways, provided that you use it in the right way. Thanks so much, James, because you you flagged the notion that Asian uh, officials and policymakers need to use this data too to engage Americans and to make the case. Uh, um, and I will just end by saying as an American, I think our administration, our government, which has made the case that Asia is really important, that it is the single most important region of our future economic potential, growth, security challenge, et cetera has a, um, if you will, carries then with it the responsibility having made that case uh, and to link and having linked it to everyday Americans to further support initiatives uh, to engage people to people connections, as Anne mentioned, to link it to key policy priorities that their voters care about, as Richard pointed out, economic issues, climate change. And I would say 
uh, and I, you know, shamelessly don't mind promoting that initiatives like the East West Center and the work it does are really important to build this kind of understanding in order to have the public and voter support for um, uh, making the Indo-Pacific uh, an area of vital concern uh, for the future of the United States. Well, we are at our time, and I, I truly thank uh, the panelist, Anne Shea from uh, Storm Media, uh, Richard White from Pew, and James Kim from Asan for their terrific commentary, their willingness to take time out of their extraordinarily busy uh, uh, institutional and other responsibilities to uh, take on a webinar and to read our report, to offer such thoughtful and incisive comments to help us improve it uh, as well. And I would like to thank those on the Zoom call, but also all of those who are joining We Can't See on the YouTube live stream and those who will watch this recording at their leisure and at a time that is uh, convenient to them. So please get a copy of the report. The link is in the chat. I'll hold it up here. This is the Asia Matters for America Public and Elite Opinion Survey, part of the Asia Matters for America series. And again, good evening to you. Good morning. Good day, wherever you're joining us from. And I bid you uh, best wishes, uh, health and safety, and look forward to future interactions. Thank you all so very much.